Good afternoon, your highnesses, excellencies and dignitaries, members of the ABLF network and all of our wonderful guests with us here today. My name is Reshan Kotecha, I'm a strategy and policy specialist based in the UK and I am, as ever, delighted to be here at the ABLF with you all. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for this session. Sujatha Keshavan is an award-winning designer who is redefining how traditional heritage crafts are viewed in luxury fashion. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sujatha founded Varana in 2016. It's a fashion house whose aim is to bring together the exceptional techniques and textures of India. Varana opened its flagship store on Dover Street in Mayfair in London in 2017 and launched its e-commerce shop earlier this year. Sujatha has many, many accolades to her name, but she was a member of the design jury at the Cannes Design Lines International Festival in 2009 and has served as a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Design and Innovation. So Sujatha, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, could you talk to us about how you set up Varana, what the founding principles were and where you get your inspiration from? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And, you know, speaking about Varana is something that's very close to my heart. Um, so, uh, you know, I actually, uh, for many, many years, I did something uh, different. I used to run uh, a brand design and consulting company. I was trained in graphic design. And for 25 years, I ran, uh, you know, what was widely regarded as uh, India's leading company in the area of brand design. And I used to help uh, Indian brands, um, you know, prepare themselves uh, to to compete in international markets. And these were different, you know, after liberalization, we found for the first time we could take our goods and services from India into other parts of the world. And so I sort of, I was uniquely poised to help these brands that were able to take their goods outside to new markets and also help them to compete with other people coming into to India, international brands. So so I had quite a wide, ex and it, this is across industries, I mean, all sorts of industries from, I worked on for airports and air, airlines and banking and finance and healthcare, and all kinds of different things. And uh, then what happened was after 25 years of running this company and doing this sort of work, I decided, um, you know, to, uh, I decided to, I, I actually sold the company to WPP, that is to uh, a British multinational a media, uh, a big media conglomerate, uh, because I didn't know, uh, you know, I didn't have any succession plans and I didn't know what exactly, uh, how much longer I could keep doing it. I didn't find uh, the right person to take over from me. So I decided to, and I also did want to have a stab at one more thing because after 25 years of doing what I was doing and, you know, at a certain level. And I mean, I, I felt that there was a repetitive element coming into my work. So I thought maybe I could have a stab at one more new thing where I start, you know, ground up and build it right from the bottom all over again, um, you know, before, before I don't have the energy to do that anymore. So I, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about for many years, you know, while I was running Ray and Keshavan, which is my, first company is is that India has so much to offer the world um, but we haven't done it yet so I thought that you know there's so many like for example we have a deep tradition of textiles and it's it's phenomenal you know the kinds of weaving and printing and dyeing techniques that we have and that we've had for centuries but uh, we do make things for some other brands but we don't really have you know, any brands of our own which really uses all these techniques and presents them to the world. And so I thought there was an opportunity to take the very best of India and create a luxury brand, which, you know, take it out into the world and therefore let the people who make these things, usually artisans with enormous skills, you know, fantastic, absolutely incredible skills, but not known outside. I thought if we could you know, if I could be the bridge that could take, use design to reinterpret what they're doing, to make it relevant to new markets, then 
you know, the, it would be a very interesting thing and good for to keep these crafts and techniques going because there is a danger of them not being able to continue because, you know, the children are not really taking to to the trade again like their forefathers used to. And the prestige has, to some extent, gone out of that kind of work. Uh, so to, what I wanted to do was to shine a light on these crafts, but do so in a very contemporary way, which is relevant to global audiences, and do so at the highest possible level. So, uh, you know, presenting a luxury brand with, with superbly made things. So, so actually, uh, and I'm, I have a co-founder, somebody who, I, you know, I had worked with earlier and I suggested this. Uh, his name is Ravi Prasad and he is the business side of Varana and I'm the creative uh, person who put the brand together. And we have, um, I must mention that uh, we started with a flagship store in London, but we have an international team of designers. So we have Italian designers, uh, Japanese designers, French. Uh, we, we work with people from different countries in our studio in Bangalore. And what was the um, the business or creative decision around making London the flagship store? So, you know, the thing is, so it was Varana from the beginning was an outward looking brand. We we knew that's what we want to do. It was the brand that because if, if it was a brand for the Indian market, uh, the product would have been quite different. We have a lot of brands already in the Indian market, which use our craft techniques and so on. But there really isn't anything I could think of which had taken this outside and the whole idea for me is to was to see if I could bring modernity to these crafts and interpret it in an absolutely contemporary and modern way so that anybody could wear it and so London was the obvious choice for us because you know there's no point starting it in India because then again as I said my product mix would be different it would be much more you know, you know for a sort of a traditional market and I felt people had already done that. And so London is a wonderful melting pot of different places. Uh, everyone travels to London to go anywhere. There are huge connections between India and London. Lots of people have homes in London and go up and down. And, um, you know, America, New York was another possibility, but it is very far away. And, you know, the time difference is absolutely, uh, you know, the opposite reversed. And it's, it does seem very far away, whereas London seems like, you know, very much, very central, very cosmopolitan, a truly international world city. So, you know, I don't think there was much argument about setting it up in London. And what were the challenges of setting up Varana in London and creating that space for the Indian crafts and textiles in the West? Did you have um, challenges getting the message across or establishing that brand? Yeah, we did have a, there, definitely, I have to say there were challenges. Um, the first was getting, you know, the back end itself before even getting it out to uh, to the market, uh, you know, just getting the product right, getting it at the fantastic level, which has never before been done, you know, like the level of fabrication, of making, of manufacture to, to sew perfectly. And, you know, and then we use the very best crops people. So, to to get uh, a consistency in the quality, and we are it's very important for us to to demonstrate that we can you know have absolutely superb quality. So so we work quite a lot on that, and um, then you know getting a store in London when we were ready uh, that was quite a challenge at the time because Mayfair is uh, you know it's 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 the place where you have to be if you want to if you want to compete in the luxury space and it was it wasn't easy because we were a new brand we were from india and so to break in and to get a really we wanted a very good very nice store so we tried many stores i mean we tried to sort of pitch for many stores finally we managed to get this absolutely beautiful so patience helped because we you know it was uh, four or five stores we tried to get and we were not really we, we were competing against very famous brands because everybody wants to be in a very small radius right you know that so it's like so we were competing against big names and you know we weren't chosen because you know people obviously the landlords felt more secure with well-established brands so 
But finally, we did manage to get uh, this beautiful townhouse, which, um, you know, it's exactly opposite the arts club. So it is a wonderful location. Absolutely wonderful location. And it used to be the McQueen store earlier, Alexander McQueen store. So it's quite well known. And so, so that was a little difficult, but we managed it. And then we redid the whole thing inside out and we completely transformed it from what it was because it had a completely different experience. And to the store, you wouldn't believe the space was the same. And again, I mean, there's so many things like, you know, just, you know, challenges because we, we were introducing new things like, you know, the way we, our techniques and so on, which people aren't really familiar with. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a bit of education to, you know, if people in the West don't really, they are very, very sustainable techniques. So people really don't know them already. So uh, there's always that element of explaining, you know, how something was created by hand and, so that oh, that went with the territory. It's like, for example, if I was to have a beautiful Kani shawl in India or use Jamdani weaving in India, people already know what it is and they know how difficult it is to do and how, you know, so you don't have to explain oh. quite as much because, but out, out in new markets, people aren't at all familiar with that. So not even with hand loom at all, really. So a lot of it is new, but it's, it's encouraging the feedback we're getting is and you're right you did totally great. review the store to the point i didn't um it's only now that you've mentioned it was mcqueen before that i've realized that's what was there first um but you you mentioned sustainable techniques and it's um you know it's wonderful that you talk about the indian sustainable techniques because the mm -hmm. fashion industry as a whole is already turning towards sustainability so you've got an absolutely on-trend brand there can you share how varana incorporates sustainability in your aesthetics and then how you educate your consumers about that yeah, so, you know, so sustainability is absolutely at the heart of our brand. It's so we, from when we started out and with our mission, we, uh, we were clear that we wanted to be a sustainable brand. And I'm very happy that now there is more talk about sustainability more generally. I think that's a great, excellent thing. And I'm, you know, it'll, it'll be very good if everybody is aware of the importance of you know, doing things sustainably. Uh, it's not very easy to be sustainable because it's um, it makes things much more complicated, you know, because sustainability, you know, it actually affects so many different aspects. It's, uh, you know, biodegradability, like when, when you source raw material and whatever material you're using, how long will it stay on the surface of the earth? Will it how long, you know, is it just going to be there for hundreds of years or can it be absorbed into the earth and, you know, become a part of it? I mean, so from that's fundamental. And then there's also the processes that you're using, the carbon footprint, the energy consumption, you know, what is the pressure you're putting on the earth's resources, like the resource utilization? That's something that we have, you have to think about to be truly sustainable. And then there's also, um, you know, how polluting are your processes? Are you create, you know, working with effluents and that go into rivers and oceans and, or are you not going to do any of that? And so there are many things, for example, if you take polyester and synthetic fabric, that's enormously polluting. I mean, in so many ways, because from when, from, just the making of it from petroleum to polyester, the process is, uh, you know, is hazardous for people who work in the industry. And then once you have it, you, every time you machine wash a polyester garment, it leaches microfibers into the sewage lines, which then go into the oceans and pollute the oceans and, you know, ruin marine life. So, so all these things have to be kept into, I mean, if you really want to be properly sustainable, then you have to think about all these different aspects. Supposing, so most brands, most brands that, you know, have been around for ages haven't actually looked at it. The majority of brands haven't really looked at it that closely or critically, but now having to do so because of pressure, the problem is that it's very difficult to change your supply chains. You know, you have to start looking for right from the raw material to the, you have to keep 
everything has to be done with new people, new materials, you know, find out new ways. And so it's a big change for people um, to do. But for Varana, fortunately, I think because that was at our mission and at our heart, it was, it's just something that that's what we did anyway. And that's something that, you know, is very, very important. And speaking of um, consideration for the earth, of course, we've um, we've seen um, the, the fact that companies have had to change and had to be reactive with COVID. So there's the proactive element and then there's the reactive element. Um, and the pandemic has upended the face of fashion. Um, how, in your opinion, has the pandemic changed the face and purpose of fashion and design? So I think that it's, I mean, I think I touched upon it a little bit. It's because the pandemic, you know, for the first time it threw into, things went so horribly wrong for people all over the world. And now the world is so interconnected because of globalization. And, you know, the, so the orders were canceled for everybody all over the world. And there were these, a lot of, for the first time, you know, the media was highlighting problems that happened, say, with workers in Bangladesh who lost lively, their livelihood completely in Vietnam and India. and and they were absolutely, you know, all orders were cancelled. And and th that together with, I mean, just the fact that this was a virus that went everywhere, it, I think there was a lot, there has been a lot of talk for the, for us, for the, you know, for the first time, or more importantly, like a light of things shine, has been shining on, uh, you know, climate change, doing things better, you know, are we creating a better world, leaving a better world for our children, things like that. So all those issues have been highlighted. And th therefore, how are we making it? it? It also gave people time to reflect, you know, the ways that people have been doing things historically without, you know, just running, without time to reflect. But the industry has that time to reflect. And I think a lot of, you know, highlighted problems uh, it's a very polluting industry in general it's one of the most polluting industries mm -hmm. fashion especially fast fashion and the use of synthetic fabrics so all of those things were highlighted so i think that it is going to lead to more conscious consumption to some extent i do think that even when things get back you know there have been questions raised and the young actually will drive this so more than you know people of my generation young people like are looking at climate change they're looking at the earth they're going to inherit and as they're saying is this what we want so so i think this is these questions have been sort of let out of the box and they're not going to go away i mean people are going to ask these questions people will be forced to be, to think about these issues so i think that's something that in terms of you know the pandemic has had a very uh, good effect I think, on the fashion. and you mentioned young people and of course the um the not necessarily being aware or knowing about the ancient crafts and arts we have in india but also of course they represent a significant and growing market for you um and of course varana's online varana's on instagram you've got people like sonam kapoor wearing your clothes um how do you see yourself as uh balancing your uh, your target audience and reaching out to the younger consumer with some of these more traditional prints? Um, so we don't do traditional prints. So that's something that I have to clarify. So what we're doing is using traditional techniques, but doing it in a very modern way. So we don't actually, we're not using the same prints that have been done, you know, for years and years. We're using the same me methods of printing. So where it's wood block or if it's methods of weaving or whatever it is, but we're we're, we're making it contemporary and you know more modern and that's very much the heart of the, the language uh, aesthetic language so uh, we want people anywhere like so you can be a woman from anywhere in the world from any country and still find that you can wear varana that, that's so the kind of things that we do are for we're looking at an international woman who's who travels who's discerning and in particularly we're designing for like an intelligent woman who's who thinks, who's a thinking woman, you know, who is interested in, you know, she's not just following a fad or a trend blindly, but, but she's style, you know, she's confident and stylish and she's doing, she's thinking about the purchases she's making and why she's making them. So that's the kind of person we're 
doing things for. Now, coming to your point about Instagram and uh, so basically what's happened with the pandemic is that there's been a, this remarkable shift to the digital uh, realm and online and e-commerce has taken off quite, uh, you know, quite amazingly. And our own at Varana also we've found there's a huge uptake in our digital business. And so we, which is quite thrilling to be honest, because, you know, suddenly you find you can reach people, you know, I look at, the things being packed for dispatch and find out who's buying what. And there's things going to Australia, to uh, Canada, to Antwerp, to I mean, just all over the globe. And, you know, we're able to ship. You. It's it's really quite something. And it's something I tell the, you know, the artisans and people we work with also. I said, you know, this thing that you made, where it's gone, it's gone to the absolutely the other side, end of the world. Or that, look, this actor's, you know, wearing what you've done. And sort of instill a sense of pride in them for doing that. But um, yeah, but with Instagram and with e-commerce now, we find that we have to, you know, we have to create many, much, there's much more image making, there's much more content that's needed from us because, you know, people are not visiting the store. And so how do you bring the brand to them and convey what we stand for? On the internet, everything is flat. So how do you, you know, communicate the superiority of our product and, and the fact that it's handmade and all of those things? So we have to, we are thinking about those things and putting out all this much more working, much more on the content, on, on creating a lot more images than we were doing, you know, before the pandemic when most of our business was really from the store. And also, I find that between the store and the e-commerce, there's a lot of, um, it's very complementary. And so people often discover Varana online, see what they want to buy, and then they come, perhaps if they're in London, they come to the store and, you know, take a look and try things on. But they come after having seen what we've done through Instagram or online. So, and you mentioned- so all these things are new. Sorry, go on. Yeah, just the importance, uh, you know, that is, we have to give now to these things. It's it's really increased in the last few months. And you mentioned an international team of designers. Where do you get your inspiration from? Where are they getting their inspiration from? How are you pulling all of that creativity together? So we, uh, you know, so we you so basically when we started, it, it's it's quite an interesting experiment because it's a truly uh, international collaborative team. And so we were looking at, you know, the skills that I can't get in India, I had to seek elsewhere. So say, for example, you know, just uh, just the fashion design, the framing of the collection. So I needed a very strong fashion designer. And so I have an Italian fashion designer who's come to us from, from Italy, who's, uh, we had French pattern cutters. Because again, India, we can't, cut, we don't have the skill and tradition of Western cuts, um, you know, because basically there's a, there's a difference in how we, we view everything flat, like our textiles, like saris are flat textiles. And we come from a tradition of things that are flat and were not sculpted, really. So, like, you know, the kind of things that you have to do in a dress or a, or a jacket, it, it requires, it's also very technical and we didn't have those skills. So where we didn't have the skills, we got them in from elsewhere. And we have a wonderful knitwear designer from Japan who's absolutely fantastic at, uh, and works with us uh, on our cashmere knits. So, so in terms of coming, you know, so basically uh, we have, so Barana has a very clear aesthetic that we've, which is refined, pared down, and, you know, where we work a lot on detail, but it's never fussy. It's, it's, minimal but with warmth it's not really even minimal it's more like what I call a refinement of excess you know and that's something that I have thought through what I think Varana should be and that percolates down and sort of affects our decision making we I also suggest the techniques that we use and so on because those are things that I know but my team works uh, you know I have a team of tech the textile designers are all from India because we they really know how to you know how to work with weaves and prints and you know there's a lot of uh, 
knowledge that to know about the techniques and how to work with the artisans. So we know the people who are making our garments and the, this team actually works intimately with, with these people. So um, have I answered your question? You or? absolutely have. Yes, Ajatha, and perfectly okay. timed as well as unfortunately we are now out of time, but thank you so much for sharing um, your inspiration and the idea behind Verana with us. Um, if you are in London or visiting London, I would highly recommend visiting the Dover Street flagship store because it is beautiful. Um, and if you have any thoughts, comments, um, want to check out their Instagram and share what you think, um, comment on with our hashtag on our social media wall with hashtag ABLF City. So thank you so much, Sujatha, for your time today and for keeping the traditional arts and crafts of India alive. And remember to my audience, if you missed a part of this session you can always come back right here um, after today to watch this session and any other session from today or previous conclaves online on demand for free anytime you'd like so thank you very much Sujatha thank you to the audience for joining us today and remember that we are back every month featuring global leaders in powerful conversations